We are in a series that we titled Keeping Christmas. When we stand back and give it serious consideration, nearly everyone would agree that the ways that we celebrate the Christmas season are profoundly shaped by two primary influences, namely tradition, characterized by the phrase, the way we've always done it, and commercialism, that is, the ways Madison Avenue tells us we should do it. That being the case, the first question we are asking in this Advent series of messages is, what ought it to mean for us, who claim to be biblical Christians, to keep Christmas? Not primarily in the sense that uh, we're in danger of losing it, although, come to think of it, that may be an appropriate concern, but rather in the sense of understanding that what we celebrate at Christmas is of such enormous significance that we should give it thoughtful attention, thoughtful attention to what truly observing Christmas requires of us, what respect and reverence it is rightfully due. And given that there, that there is no command in Scripture that we should celebrate the birth of the Savior, nor any prescriptions in its pages for those who wish to do so, a second question logically arises, which is, are there any meaningful models in the pages of Scripture itself that might provide us with clues to priorities or practices that might in turn guide us into a deeper, more satisfying and spiritually nourishing observance? One of the questions we've been asking each Sunday and will continue through the series is what simply does it mean to keep Christmas? This week I came across something written by the British Bible translator J.B. Phillips. and Some of you will recognize him as the one who wrote a well-known paraphrase of the New Testament. It was kind of the, uh, the living Bible before there was a living Bible, uh, the message before there was the message. These paragraphs rang particularly true and timely. Here's what he said. The particular danger which faces us as Christmas approaches is unlikely to be contempt for the sacred season, but nevertheless our familiarity with it may easily produce in us a kind of indifference. The true wonder and mystery may leave us unmoved. Familiarity may easily blind us to the shining fact that lies at the heart of Christmas tide. We are all aware of the commercialization of Christmas. We can hardly help being involved in the frantic business of buying and sending gifts and cards. We shall without doubt enjoy the carols, the decorations, the feasting and jollification. It's a good British term, jollification. The presence, the parties, the dancing, and the general atmosphere of goodwill that almost magically permeates the days of Christmas. But we may not always see clearly that so much decoration and celebration has been heaped upon the festival that the historic fact upon which all the rejoicing is founded has been almost smothered out of existence. What we are in fact celebrating is the awe-inspiring humility of God, And no amount of familiarity with the trappings of Christmas should ever blind us to its quiet but explosive significance. For Christians believe that so great is God's love and concern for humanity that he himself became a man. Amid the sparkle and the color and music of the day's celebration, we do well to remember that God's insertion of himself into human history was achieved with an almost frightening quietness and humility. There was no advertisement, no publicity, no special privilege. In fact, the entry of God into his own world was almost heartbreakingly humble. This almost beggarly beginning has been romanticized by artists and poets throughout the centuries. Yet I believe that at least once a year, we should look steadily at the historic fact, and not at any pretty picture. So this morning I'd like to lead you again into the historical facts of the main event of Christmas, 
in the familiar words of Luke 2, 8 through 20, made famous to recent generations by none other than Charlie Brown's best friend, Linus. So let's stand and read together. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. This is God's word. You may be seated. And that is what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. Well, before we get into that passage, I want us to just kind of rewind briefly and take a look at the first seven verses of Luke 2 that precede the passage we just read together that describe the main event of Jesus' birth. And as we do that... I'd like you to consider with me what really happened, what really happened that night in the city of Bethlehem. Let me read for us, Luke 2, 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town, And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them. In the end, now consider just a few observations from this passage. First, notice with me that Luke intends for us to understand the birth of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem as a matter of historical fact. Verse 5 In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. So so notice that he takes the birth of Jesus and he attaches it to another well-known, at the time, historical event. In the ancient world, this was a very common way for historians to identify the span of time during which events took place. The decree was by Caesar Augustus, so Luke is dating the events he's about to describe during the time of his reign. And then he provides us with a smaller and more specific window during the time of Caesar Augustus' reign, but when during the time when Quirinius was governor of Syria. You say, I have no idea when that was. Well, the people that first read this did. Compare that to two other nearby passages in which he dates events similarly. For example, in Luke 1, 5, at the start of the narrative regarding Zechariah and Elizabeth in Luke 1, Luke wants his readers to know that this occurred in the days of Herod, king of Judea. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. But in Luke 3, 1 to 3, I think is the the, the granddaddy of them all, 
where he goes to great lengths to date the beginning of the ministry of Zechariah and Elizabeth's son, John the Baptist. Now listen to what he says here. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iterea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Do, do you think that Luke wanted them to know precisely when John's ministry began? Far cry from once upon a time, or even long ago in a galaxy far, far away, wouldn't you say? Second, notice that God, the sovereign God, literally moved the entire Roman world to get Joseph and Mary and in utero Jesus from one town to another, from Nazareth to Bethlehem. See, the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem was not a matter of chance or mere fate, but the plan and the purpose of the sovereign God in fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Micah, prophet Micah, chapter 5, verse 2, you're familiar with this. But you, O Bethlehem of Phratha, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. God intended that his son be born in Bethlehem. Third, despite popularized depictions, Jesus probably wasn't born on that very first night in Bethlehem. You're going to hate me. You're going to hate me today, actually. I'm going to, I'm going to take apart the story. The, the image of Mary going into labor at the gates of the village is not present in the biblical narrative. Luke simply says that it was while they were there that the time came for her to give birth. He, he doesn't present it as their first night in town. So we should, we should simply understand that they are actually staying somewhere in Bethlehem. They've already found accommodations of some kind in the village. Probably, sorry, in a house. Fourth, try as you might, you won't find an innkeeper in the biblical narrative. There's no scene in the Bible where Joseph is running down the street, frantically knocking on doors, hoping that someone might let them in. And being turned away by a pimply-faced guy working the reception desk at the Bethlehem Hilton. There was no Hilton. There wasn't even a Motel Motel 6. There were no Airbnbs or VRBOs or even KOAs. An inn or a hotel might be found in large cities like Jerusalem or Jericho. But not in Bethlehem. Mary gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, not because there was no place for them in the inn, but because there was no room for them in the Cataluma. You say the what? The, the Cataluma, the guest room. See, verse 7 of Luke 2 literally reads, there was no room for them in the guest room. The Cataluma, or the guest room, was usually situated on the upper level of the home. It was often known as the upper room. Did Luke know the difference between an inn and and a guest room? Was he simply confused here? Of course he understood the difference. You remember Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan that appears in Luke chapter 22? In that story, the Samaritan checks the injured man into an inn. And the word there is not Cataluma. The word there is Pandakion. In fact, in Israel today, they refer to a hotel as a pandoc. Jesus later said to his disciples, 
Go into Jerusalem and tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room, the Cataluma, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished, prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. There was no room for Mary and Joseph in a room similar to the one in which Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples. And what we find is that Joseph and Mary, in their ancestral city for a period of time, whether long or short, we don't know, used a manger, a feeding trough, as a crib for their newborn son. I heard someone this week talk about the fact that when their triplets were born, and they were young and poor, the three triplets slept in three drawers of the dresser. We make do. Where would a manger have been located? Probably in a cave where wine and wheat were stored, where special animals were kept. You know, the the landscape around Bethlehem is honeycombed with caves. And archaeological excavations of ancient homes in Bethlehem reveal that many of them were built above caves, which would then have provided a kind of basement. And there are several reasons why it would actually have made sense for Mary to have her baby in a location like that. First of all, the house in which they were staying was apparently crowded. There was no room in the guest room. For that reason alone, the Cataluma would not have been an appropriate place to give birth. Uh, By contrast, the place where the animals were kept would have provided some privacy because childbirth is not an event for everyone's eyes. Uh, Neither is it for everyone's ears. It's not usually a particularly quiet affair. It was a holy night to be sure, but you can be equally sure that it was not a silent night. And then there's the matter of the fact that these are all Jews and the matter of ritual purity. Giving giving birth involves some shedding of blood. So giving birth in a place away from the others would have protected their ritual purity. It also occurs to me that they probably slept much better in the cave than they would have in the Cataluma, where other families were at least trying to sleep as well. And so you can imagine... Lots of people sleeping in one room because it was a small city and there were a lot of people that had to go there because Caesar Augustus said they had to. So one can imagine moms and dads snoring their heads off, young children fussing and crying, mothers or fathers shushing them, people getting up and down throughout the night for various reasons. While in the cool and quiet of the cave, Joseph and his family slept in heavenly peace. It may not have been all bad. We might ask whether the sovereign God, though, couldn't have arranged for more comfortable accommodations for the entry of his son into the world. And the answer is, of course, he could have. He could have. Theologically, we would observe that the Son of God, being born in humble circumstances, was one step, step one, in his agenda of emptying himself, as Paul put it in Philippians 2, humbling himself for the ultimate purpose of saving his people from their sins. But from a purely practical point of view, the manger accomplished two basic purposes. If you look, if you look hard at the text and force yourself to think critically, It first provided a bed for baby Jesus, to be sure, and second, it became a sign for the shepherds. How would they know which of the many babies there must have been in Bethlehem was the Christ child? It would be the one and only baby boy whom they would find wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. With those things in view, let's consider together then what really happened in the fields near Bethlehem, 
out there where the shepherds were. Consider first the significance of Jesus being born in Bethlehem. We've already seen that Micah prophesied that Bethlehem would be the birthplace of Messiah or Christ. Its name Bethlehem in Hebrew is actually two words, bait, which means house, and lehem, which means bread. Bethlehem, bait lehem, means house of bread. Jesus would later claim, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So there's a predictive element in the bread of life having been born in the house of bread. The prophet Micah called it Bethlehem Ephrathah. Why is that? Well, Ephrathah was actually the earlier name for this town. Before it was called Bethlehem, it was called Ephrathah. The two names get connected together at times. Ephrathah means fruitful. It's the same name as the little town of Ephrata in eastern Washington that's surrounded by a fruitful agricultural landscape. Bethlehem is where Jacob whose name became Israel, buried his wife, Rachel, when she died giving birth to their final son, Benjamin. And her tomb is there to this day. It was also the home of Boaz, who married Ruth, and together they had a son named Obed, who had a son named Jesse, who had a son named David, who became the king of Israel. But before David became king, he shepherded his, shepherded his father's flocks in these same fields around Bethlehem where the angels appeared to shepherds. Never after, Bethlehem was known as the city of David. And as was prophesied, it became the birthplace of Messiah Jesus, whom the prophets said would be called the son of David. At verse 8 of Luke 2, we read these words, And in the same region... There were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Now, you might know that shepherds were not highly regarded. Uh, they, they weren't allowed, for example, to keep their, fo- their flocks close to the city. Because of the nature of their work, they were nearly always in a condition of ritual uncleanness. They were regarded as untrustworthy, and so, among other things, a shepherd was not allowed to testify in a court of law. They were not entirely outcast, but neither were they embraced by polite Jewish society. So it's surprising, and it's it's noteworthy, that an angel of the Lord appeared, and the glory of the Lord was revealed, not to aristocrats or rulers, or even religious leaders, but to the humble, to shepherds. We read that as the angel of the Lord, an angel of the Lord, appeared to them, the glory of the Lord shone around them. I memorized it in the King James when I was a child. It's the one that Linus recites in Charlie Brown's Christmas. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them, And they were sore afraid. And notice that this glory, this radiance, was not the angel's glory. It's the glory of the Lord, reflected by an angel who had just come from the very presence of the Lord. One of the tools of biblical interpretation, when when you want to understand what a biblical passage is really all about, is to watch for repeated words or phrases. Here in verse 9, we read the word Lord twice. And then once again in verse 11, an angel of the Lord appears. In his appearing, the glory of the Lord shines all around the shepherds. And this angel of the Lord proceeds to bring a message about the birth of Christ the Lord. And then in verse 15, the shepherds go in search of the things that the Lord had made known to them. See, the message of Christmas, and so Christmas itself is a message from the Lord about the advent of the Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, entering into human history in human flesh. 
Marcy and I recently watched the uh, Christmas special created by the producers of the Chosen series, uh, which I happen to think, though not perfect, may just be the best screen portrayal of the person and ministry of Jesus that's ever been produced, and which I highly recommend. But when we came to this particular scene in the story, I was disappointed. A small group of three or four shepherds are sitting by a fire when when suddenly a, a bright light from heaven shines around them. They're, they're panic-stricken. The impression that uh, that's given is that something's being communicated, but you don't hear any words. And two thoughts occurred to me. First, how very difficult it would be for a movie director to adequately portray something that is so utterly other, so utterly unique, powerful, and supernatural. Uh, So I cut them some slack on that point. But second, that to exclude the message of the angel and the subsequent worship by an angel army is to miss an enormous opportunity. Why? Because the message spoken by the angel is the very heart of the gospel. It's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. So let's look at it. First, the angel says to the terrified shepherds, Fear not. Well, why not? (laughs) Fear seems entirely appropriate to the moment, doesn't it? I mean, anyone with a pulse would have been uh, scared out of their wits, I think, by the by the suddenness and the brightness and the glory that was assaulting their senses. They probably feared for their lives because these Jewish shepherds would have known from God's word that no one can see the Lord and keep on living. And, and because for sinful people to suddenly find themselves in the very presence of the holy God speaks judgment. It's appointed, the Bible says, to man once to die, and after that, the judgment. So the angel tells them, why not? It's because this moment, this message, is not bad news, but very good news. Not about judgment, but about joy. Exceedingly great joy. And and not just for some, but for all the people. The word he uses that's translated the people is laos. It's the word from which we get our word laity. In the Old Testament, it was a term used specifically for the congregation of Israel. All the people in this place means all the congregation of Israel. The angel proceeds to tell them the good news. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. A Savior is born unto you. Not only is it a wonderful personal message, but it personalized the prophecy of Isaiah 9. And I'm pretty sure that, that these who had been taught, who had memorized large portions of God's word from earliest childhood, would not have missed the meaning of those two words, would not have missed the connection to Isaiah chapter 9. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace." The one who is born is born unto us, for us, for you, for me. The angel told them he is born this day, the day for which all Israel had been waiting for thousands of years, is this day. Imagine if you got up in the morning and an angel appeared in your bedroom and said, this is the day Jesus is coming. This is the day. It's finally come. Unbelievable. Amazing. God is keeping his promise. 
The angel went on, he's born in the city of David. Well, of course he is. Every, every resident of Bethlehem was fully aware of Micah's prophecy regarding their hometown. And then the angel announces three titles for this one who is born. And it's worth making note that nowhere else in all of the Bible do these three titles appear together this way. He is Savior, a rescuer, a a deliverer. He is Christ, the anointed one, the the long-awaited Messiah of Israel. He is Lord. In, In Greek, the word is kurios one who possesses and exercises absolute authority because he is the master, he is the ruler, he is the owner of the house. In Hebrew, the word would have been Yahweh, the covenant God, the eternal God of Israel. An astonishing announcement. That, that the Savior, the Christ, the Lord is born and is lying in a manger over in Bethlehem. And then the angel gave the shepherds a sign. And this will be a sign, a validating proof for you that what we are telling you, what we are announcing to you is actually true. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And with that sign, will you observe with me that there came an implied commission. They were to go to Bethlehem and find the baby. And in finding him, they would experience the validation of the message the angel delivered. But the angelic show of light and sound wasn't over just yet. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. We might just note in passing that a a heavenly host refers to an angel army. These are a warrior class of angels. There's a multitude of them. We don't know how many. The, The multitude means a lot, a large number. And they were saying, glory to God in the highest. That's what we sang earlier in Latin. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Glory to God in the highest. It's impossible for us to picture this in our minds, I I know. (laughs) But try to stretch your imagination if you can to capture this moment. It's not unusual these days. To hear Christians describe an experience as a God thing or a a God moment. But if ever there was a genuine God moment, this was one of the greatest. Angels are appearing to them in large numbers. They're surrounded by the glory of the Lord as the angels are worshiping the Lord. No longer filled with fear, the shepherd's inner experience now is great joy and great peace. So you see there in the field, those humble shepherds were allowed to experience a preview of the glory, the joy, the peace of heaven itself. Verse 15, Luke tells us that the angels went away from them into heaven. I've often been curious about that phrase. What did that look like for the angels to go away from them into heaven? Did they just like, uh, you know, rocket into space until they disappeared from the naked eye? That would have been pretty cool. Did they just suddenly vanish? Vaporize? Did they simply step, step behind a veil or a cosmic curtain, as it were? Did they slip into another dimension? Somebody, someday we will know. What we do know is what the shepherds did next. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Now, I imagine it may have happened like this. We don't know how many shepherds saw and heard the angels that night. I kind of like to think that there may have been been a lot of them. 
we tend to think that there are a few because we can't fit them all into our nativity scenes. But I imagine one of them, maybe a leader among them, said to another, well, you want to go? And the other said, oh, well, yeah, I want to go. And he looked at the rest of them and said, you guys want to go? And they all said, you know we want to go. And so off they went to see this thing that has happened. This thing that has happened. Notice that what they went in search of was not an idea or a philosophy or a religion. They didn't go in search of their personal identities but something tangible and real that could be seen, something that had happened. The claim of the Bible is that the birth of God in human flesh is something that happened in real time, in real geography, witnessed by real people living real lives. And so it's of essential importance that we acknowledge and come to terms with this. Why? Because there often enters in, in our manner of reading this narrative, an excessive sense of otherworldliness. And if we read it just that way, we can easily consign it to a place of irrelevance, wrap it up in a fuzzy sentimentalism, store it in a box that we only open during one season of the year. In writing his gospel, Luke is not advancing mere mythology, but hard history. Remember in in the preamble, verses 1 to 4 of chapter 1, he indicates his intention in writing. He says that his approach is to write an orderly account based on the testimony of eyewitnesses, not so as to merely entertain the curiosity of a casual reader, but rather to provide certainty and therefore confidence to those who would read the story, who would take it seriously. So they went in search of this thing that had happened, that the Lord had made known to them. Notice that they didn't say that the angel has made known to us, even though the message came through an angel, but instead that the Lord has made known to us. They understood that the message of the angel of the Lord had come from the Lord himself. And in seeking, they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. I would have loved to hear a little story about the search, wouldn't you? What that was like. They were knocking on doors. And they became eyewitnesses. What did they do next? What they did next tells us what the shepherds have to teach us about keeping Christmas. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had, all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. So the shepherds teach us, first of all, that Christmas is about mission. It's about, if you will, evangelization. And when they saw it, They made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. When they saw what? When they saw Jesus. Notice that it was when they saw Mary and Joseph and the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger that they became witnesses. You can't be a witness of what you yourself have not seen and experienced. Which is why I'm contending that only Christians have the capacity to truly keep Christmas. Everyone else celebrates, frankly, something else. Something that surrounds Christmas. That, that, that thing that J.B. Phillips says smothers the essence of the holiday, of, of the season, of the event. Having seen it, they made known the saying that had been told them by the angel concerning this child. What was the message they had received? In summary, 
that the child they would find wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger was none other than the Savior, who is the Christ, the promised and long-awaited Messiah. Not only that, but the eternal living God. To whom did they make these things known? Well, seemingly to everyone they met, beginning with Mary and Joseph. How do I know that? Verses 18 and 19, all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them, but Mary, in particular, treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. I heard a well-known pastor this week say that there's an, an omission here. Because what was the conversation that the shepherds had with Mary and Joseph? I, I don't think it's admitted, omitted at all. I think what we're being told is that they told Mary and Joseph. I mean, the question Mary and Joseph must have asked was like, who are you and what are you doing here? Right? I mean, I'm trying to nurse the baby. Would you guys get, get, get out? And I'm pretty sure just to validate, to legitimize their presence at, at Mary and Joseph's place, wherever whatever that was, a cave or a stable or whatever it was, they had to tell the story. We're just shepherds. We, we've been out in the field doing what we do, and here's this thing that happened. And Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. They, the shepherds were compelled. Think, think about what you feel compelled to share with others. I, I was thinking about this, this as I was preparing this message. M- maybe it's something your children or grandchildren have said or done or accomplished. I mean, we're, we're all about that, right? I'm, I'm discovering as a grandfather that the stories I like to tell are about my two-year-old grandson. Uh, and I could keep you busy with stories for a good long time. Or maybe it's the latest wind by the Seahawks or the Mariners or the Sounders or the Kraken or some other terrible team. Uh, Or or the performance of a particular player. Uh, Maybe it's the things you saw and experienced on your most recent vacation. The things we feel a genuine compulsion to share with others are the things that interest us, that excite us the most, that are uppermost in our minds and hearts. And what seems clear to me, is that the shepherds first told Mary and Joseph about their experience of the angels in the fields. And then it was seen that they shared it all with everyone else they happened to meet, who were in turn, Luke tells us, filled with wonder at what they heard. Shepherds became the very first evangelists. See, evangel is the word that's used by the angel, when he says, I bring you good news. That's that's the word evangel. Gyuangalizo. The shepherds would tell us that keeping Christmas involves fulfilling our mission. It's being his witnesses. Luke is telling the story, I think, in, in such a way that we, his readers, would be impressed by the news so deeply that we would understand that it must be broadcast as widely and as deeply as possible, not kept to ourselves. As some people experience in an exclusively inward manner. Sometimes I'll hear someone say, well, I don't talk about my my religion because it's a very personal matter. I want to say, well, then your religion isn't Christianity. If If it's only a very personal inward matter, it's not Christianity. Second, the shepherds teach us that keeping Christmas is about celebration. Yay! Verse 20, it says, And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And in their case, the celebration was expressed in worship and praise as they had seen and heard from the angel army. In the same way that they felt compelled to tell everyone what they heard, they had heard and seen, they also felt compelled to glorify and praise God. Let me ask you, does, does the way you're utilizing your time this month cause you to glorify and praise God, or are you just tired? 
already. A little stressed, a little anxious. The shepherds would tell us that keeping Christmas is also about worship. So let's land this plane. What, what might choosing to keep Christmas like the shepherds look like for us today? It'll look like mission and celebration. It will look like making witness and worship the priorities of the season. So take the opportunity to tell the story to as many as you can in as many ways as you can. But which story? Tell the Christmas story. It's amazing how many people have never actually heard the real story. Share it with your children and your grandchildren. Read the story directly from the Bible. Find videos that dramatize the story. Be careful about those. But find videos that dramatize the story. Pay attention so that you can clarify to them what the writers and directors may not have gotten quite right. Show them from the Bible why it's true. Share the Christmas story with your friends. Be creative in in figuring out how to convey it. Maybe it's the content of the Christmas card you choose to send. Choose that card thoughtfully. What does it, what does the artwork convey? What does the greeting convey? Does it actually assist in telling the story of the birth of the Son of God in human flesh? Might it actually even open a conversation? Does, does it assist with communicating the message of the gospel? Don't waste that opportunity. Tell the story of how you came to personal faith in Christ. And you say, oh, oh, that. (laughs) But realize this this is actually the story the shepherds told. Because their experience was life transforming. They were the first to believe in Jesus. Ever think about that? Shepherds were the very first to believe in Jesus. And they were super motivated to tell that story, what it meant to them personally. Do your children know why you believe in Jesus? Have your grandchildren heard the story of how you transferred your trust to Jesus Christ? How about your neighbors, your your co-workers? You know, you, you could tell your faith story in a one-to-one conversation. You, you could share the story at a dinner table on Christmas Day. You could include your personal story of faith in a Christmas letter that accompanies the cards you send out. You could write a brief account and post it on social media. Here's why I believe in Christmas. It's because I believe in the Christ of Christmas. And here's why. When the angel said, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased, he was defining the scope of those who would receive the peace that the Prince of Peace came to give. I mentioned earlier that I first memorized the Christmas story, Luke 2, 1 to 20, in the King James Version. And in the King James it says, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, listen, Peace, goodwill to men. And you're left with the impression that the Christmas is simply about God's favor, God's goodwill to just about anybody. But I want you to know that that's not how the biblical text reads. It says, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Who are those with whom he is pleased? The writer of Hebrews tells us without faith it's impossible to please God. The peace of God is given only to those who by faith have trusted in God's Son, Jesus Christ, as their only Savior and Lord. We are not all God's children. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. So tell the story, tell your story, 
and then join with the angels and shepherds in taking advantage of every opportunity for worship and praise. We do that every Sunday here at LifePoint. Every Sunday throughout this month, we're singing songs about the birth of Jesus. You can play Christian Christmas music in your home, your car, your office. Fill the air in those places with praise and worship. It's not complicated, really. It's just rehearsing the story to those who would hear it and giving glory to the one who made it all happen. I hope you'll be keeping Christmas this year like Mary, like Joseph, like the shepherds. And next week, we'll learn from the old man Simeon and the old woman Anna what it means to keep Christmas. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this amazing, amazing story and the proclamation, the announcement that you have sent a Savior who is Christ the Lord You cared enough, as Hallmark says, to send the very best. And Lord, may we be good tellers of the story, and may we be good worshipers. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.